And go ahead and open up your Bibles to 1 John as we slowly but surely go through chapter 2. So let us begin now. Verse 16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, it's not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away in the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. Little children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now, many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. So, the hope tonight is to finish what we started, talk about the Antichrist, and then next week we'll talk about the little Antichrist, or rather, the spirit of the Antichrist. Tonight's study, it's called Do Not Be Deceived. Now, I'm having a hard time with my stuff coming up here, so I'm going to be doing a lot of this. I hope you guys don't mind seeing my back, but it is what it is. So every temptation from the enemy and from the world will fall under these three categories that we just read, right? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. We can pretty much, every single temptation that we struggle with can be number two, can be traced to, can be tracked down to these three things. And so John tells us that those three things is not of the Father. They're not of the Father. And sometimes we can feel like that. Lord, why are you letting this happen? Why are you tempting me? And James tells us, God does not tempt us. He does not tempt us at all. He cannot be tempted himself. And what he says is we are tempted because sometimes we allow ourselves to be tempted. Because sometimes we put ourselves in situations that we shouldn't be in. And we see things and we hear things and we put ourselves in places that lead us to a bigger setup or a slippery slope. And we put ourselves in a situation that we shouldn't be in. And so God knows that we have a fleshly, bodily nature physical needs that feel good when satisfied. You know, God has given us that ability. Yet it is not in God's nature to influence us through the lust of the flesh. And God knows that we have eyes and that appearance means a lot to us. But God always looks beyond the outward appearance and it is not in God's nature to influence us through the lust of the eyes. God knows that we have emotional and psychological needs to be wanted and to accomplish things. And he, he made us this way. But it is not in God's nature to influence us through the pride of life. So these three things that we are constantly battling is not of the Father. Now, the devil knows this too. So let me read it to you like this. The devil knows that we have a fleshly, bodily nature and physical needs that feel good when satisfied. And it is his plan to influence us through the lust of the flesh. He knows we have eyes and that appearance means a lot to us. And it is his scheme to influence us through the lust of the eyes. He knows that we have emotional, psychological needs to be wanted and to accomplish things. And it is a strategy to influence us through the pride of life. As God has created us, the enemy knows us. He knows that we respond to the lust of the eyes and to the lust of the flesh and to the pride of life. He knows that. And so he'll put things that will entice that. He will put things before us or in our minds or whatever to try to cause us to bite on any of those three things. And so John tells us, be aware of the world, be aware of Satan. And really what he does is he, he puts the Father versus the world because we're talking about the light of the Father walking in the light and the love of the Father and that is walking in his love, which means wa uh, loving one another. But what he does here by telling us about the world and then about the Antichrist and then the Antichrists, he's basically telling us these things are the things that attack our love for God and us walking in the light. And so he puts the Father versus the world. And as Christians, this is something that we constantly have to be aware of. We must constantly be aware of how often the world wants to dominate our thinking, behavior, and actions. And let us just be aware of this. It doesn't always have to be sin. It could just be life. Just regular old life. That even life wants to dominate our thinking, our behavior, and our actions. 
of course, sin and temptation as well. So we must constantly evaluate whether our thoughts, behavior, and actions are more of the world or of God. And that's why I love coming to church. Because for whatever reason, the way the Lord works it, the way the Spirit leads, it always causes me to evaluate. How am I doing? Where am I at? How's it been? I love that. That's the reason why morning devotions are so important for us. You know, it's not necessarily commanded for us to be saved that we do our devotions every day, but boy, is it stressed in the Bible just how beneficial and how important it is for us to be in the Word, really in fellowship with our Heavenly Father on a daily basis because it's on a daily basis that we live in this world. It's on a daily basis that we have to deal with our flesh. And it's on a daily basis sometimes that we have to deal with the enemy. And so it's only right, it's only wise for us to, on a daily basis, be in the word and be in fellowship with our Father. Really, one, to worship him, to thank him, and to cause us to walk in the word, walk in the light, walk in love, and then to evaluate whether our thoughts, behavior, and actions are more of the world or of God. Let me just tell you this, and some of you know this firsthand, the more you do this, the better it is. It really is. You know, just the more I sense, the more I hear from God, the more I'm humbled before God. Not always because I humble myself before his greatness, but because I have to humble myself because of my mistakes and because of my sins and my errors and, you know, lapse of judgment or whatever. But it's only in those times where I can come before the Lord and go, Lord, is there more of you or more of the world in me right now? Are my thoughts dominated, my behavior, my actions dominated by the world or by your word? It's constantly something that we need to be doing. And so I want to kind of give you a couple of things that I see in the scriptures. We saw this, how Jesus overcame, right? The way Jesus overcame last week. And so here's some verses. How to overcome the lust of the flesh. And Paul said this, so I run with purpose in every step. I love that. I run with purpose in every step. I'm not just shadow boxing, which is really just wasting time and energy. Well, that's something that I have to be very careful with, wasted time and energy. Fighting for things that really don't matter. Or trying to get things that really are just shadows compared to the glory of God. So Paul says, I am not just shadow boxing. If you guys have ever done any shadow boxing, you have to be careful with shadow boxing. Yes, it's a good exercise, but you can actually throw your arms out and mess your elbows and your shoulders up because you're not hitting anything. I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Love that. That was Paul's mission when it came to his flesh that he had a purpose in every step, he wasn't wasting time or energy, and he was training or disciplining his body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. So how do we overcome the lust of the flesh? Don't allow your body to have mastery over you. Maybe it's laziness. Don't let laziness have mastery over you. Maybe it's temper. Do not let your temper have mastery over you. It could be a number of things. It could be anything, everything, or it could be just one thing, but don't let things of the flesh have mastery over you. Paul said it like this in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. And we have to be honest sometimes that the things that we invest so much time into and so much energy into, so much concentration into, are not really helpful when it comes to the kingdom of God. That might be beneficial, maybe from a worldly point of view, a fleshly point of view, but when it comes to a godly point of view, it's not helpful. He says, all things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. I think that's the kind of mission that we need to have when it comes to our flesh, the kind of purpose that we need to have when it comes to our bodies. How do you overcome the lust of the flesh? Though all things may be lawful, and are they helpful? Though all things may be lawful, I will not be brought under the power of any. 
And I believe that Paul was talking about sin, but I also believe that he was talking about things like food and sleep, things that we crave. Have you noticed that when you go on vacation, we pretty much just do more of that, sleep more, eat more, pretty much. Relax more maybe, right? That's vacation, right? And amen, praise the Lord. God, thank you, Lord, for vacation or Sabbaths, you know. Thank you, Lord, for Sabbath. The Lord wants us to rest. But even in resting, even in resting, the Lord says, in your day of rest, Sabbath, honor me. Because sometimes just one day off is enough for my flesh to get riled up and lead me to a slippery slope. So don't let your flesh come under the power of anything except the power of Holy Spirit. If we're going to be under the influence of anything, if we're going to be under the power of anything, let it be Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Now to overcome the lust of the eyes, David said, I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. That's a discipline and a sacrifice. Because some of the things that we need to remove from our eyes are things that we really, really like. Perhaps are just super entertaining. Oh, it's so hilarious. I mean, that show is just so funny. But man, is it evil. And just the things that we have to be careful with. Listen, I'm in the same boat. I'm not, I'm not claiming perfection here. I know the struggle. And it's something that I constantly have to be reminded of. I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. And David, he knew that one measure of a righteous life was what one chose to set before the eyes. How many of us have gotten into trouble because of the things that we have seen, the thing that we have allowed our eyes to watch, and it's caused us to go into some dark places? You know, some of those things that we've allowed to, for, you know, to view, the things that we have seen, how that's led us astray, has led us away from the Lord. Now, we got to be very careful with that. <laughs> McLaren said this, the recesses of an eastern palace were often foul with lust and hid extravagances of caprice and self-indulgence. But this ruler, talking about David, will behave there as one who has Jehovah for a guest. And that's just the way David, that's what David meant when he said that. So I am going to live like God is here with me. He is one of my guests and I will be at my best behavior because God is with me and the truth of the matter is God is with us he is within us so the things that we do outside of our bodies and even the things that we do within our bodies our mind and our hearts that we would live like this God is with me you know, oftentimes it's like we say oh God is watching you like oh oh no he's watching like he's just waiting to see us slip up it's not that he's watching us like, like, like some landlord or some guard. He wants to be with us. See the difference? It's not just watching. He wants to be with us. And when we live in sin, we compromise in sin, it grieves his heart. And yes, it angers him, for God is a God of righteousness and holiness. And though he is the God of love, he is also the God of wrath. I mean, he is holy, holy, holy. And if you continue persistent sin, unrepentant sin, it grieves the Holy Spirit. It offends our Heavenly Father. It hurts Him, breaks His heart. And really what we're doing is we're slapping Jesus as He's dying on the cross for our sins. Or the way Paul puts it, trampling upon the blood of Jesus Christ. Understand that trampling over something in those days, in that region, even today, was the ultimate insult to trample something underfoot because they considered underneath the foot the dirtiest place of the body. And so to get something as sacred as the blood of Jesus Christ and to trample over it and just be like nonchalant when it comes to our attitude and our relationship with sin, I see that's something that we got to repent of. I mean, the church at large really needs to repent of that. There has to be more godliness and less worldliness. 
Job said, I have made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I look upon a young woman? For what is the allotment of God from above and the inheritance of the Almighty from on high? Is it not destruction for the wicked and disaster for the workers of iniquity? And here Job, in the fear of the Lord, says, I have made a covenant with my eyes. Really, I've made a covenant with my eyes before the Lord that I will not lust after, that I will not allow sin to pleasure my flesh. I've made a covenant before the Lord, for as he says, destruction for the wicked, disaster for the workers of iniquity. And how many, how many men, women of God that, that have been in pivotal places in the church at large have fallen because of some scandal, because of some sin, because they didn't do what Job did, made a covenant with their eyes before the Lord. And Job did not regard discipline over the eyes as the only measure of godliness, but a primary one. I mean, it was primary. For, it wasn't an option for him. Now, this has to happen. And I, and I believe that in order for us to overcome the pride of life and the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes, this has to be of importance to us. It has to be primary, non-negotiable. That has to be our attitude towards it. Of course, the battle is keeping it non-negotiable, Right? And not compromising. But at least in my purpose, my purpose in my heart is to not give in to the pride of life, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes. So help me God. And that's why, again, it's so important that we come before him every day because every day it's a battle. Lord, help me because it's on today. And even if if I don't think it's on, it's on anyways. Because the enemy is on 24-7. He doesn't take vacations. He's, he's He knows. His time is short, and the enemy will try to get us at any possible time. How to overcome the pride of life. Well, look at what Paul said again in Philippians chapter 2 concerning our icon, Jesus. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God is highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, and those in heaven, and those on earth, and of those under the earth. And so Jesus humbled himself before his heavenly Father. And his will, his covenant before the Lord is, I will do your will. I will humble myself and be obedient to you, Father, even to the death. And that's exactly what Jesus, our hero, did, right? Our icon did exactly what the Father had in mind, what was his will to save us. And Jesus willingly did this. He willingly gave his life for us so that at every, or at the sound of his name, everyone should bow to him. And I love that, that Jesus went through some extreme circumstances, extreme shame and hardships, truly, literally, Value the shadow of death. But here's Heavenly Father lifting him up above. And maybe that's where you find yourself going through a value of the shadow of death. Maybe you find yourself going through some serious, difficult times and you're just wondering, Lord, when can I catch a break? God, please have mercy. And let me promise you this, he will have mercy. And that break is coming. And what if I was to tell you, maybe that break is not here on earth still worth following him and living for him. It's still worth dying for him because no matter what, as believers, we're going to have ultimate break, ultimate vacation with ultimate 401k plans, ultimate mansions, ultimate peace, no tears, no drama, no bills, no nothing, no taxes. Woo. Can I get an amen? amen? Yeah, that which is most valuable here on earth it will be underfoot because even the there'll be streets of gold. That which is most valuable to man right now, gold, money, wealth, power, it's going to be what's going to be made the streets. That's what's going to make the streets in our heavenly place. Amen and amen. That's the ultimate break. And that's what's going to keep you going forward as you continue going through struggles in life because life can be a struggle. So overcome the world. And just like John said in verse 17, and the world is passing away. 
Let us remember that. Maybe that's something that we need to write down, some, something that we need to repeat to ourselves over and over and over again because it's something that Christians struggle with over and over and over again where they put the world and make it prominent in their life. And it dominates them. It dominates them to where they don't even come to church anymore or at least not regularly or I can't even be in ministry. I'm just too busy and things are just happening and I, I got to step out. I got to step away. Take a break from church. It's just, life is just too much. You're allowing the world to dominate you. It's affecting you. The Bible talks about do not forsake the assembling of one another in the book of Hebrews, especially as you see the day approaching, talking about the last days. Hey, all I'm seeing is things are getting worse and worse and worse, and amen, because Jesus prophesied that. So all that does is prove that Jesus is true and that his word is true. He says, do not be troubled by these things. And yet, so many Christians allow themselves to become troubled to the point to where they don't even want to fellowship anymore. They don't got time for the word. They don't got time for devotions. They don't got time for worship, ministry, giving, whatever. That's how the world dominates, and that's something that we have to be careful with. And so like John said, the world is passing away and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. That's a promise that if you do the will of God, you will abide forever. Now, you may not feel like it, but it's not about feelings, right? It's about faith. And that's what pleases the Lord. And, and God is powerful, and, and he acts on behalf of faith. When there is faith, God is able to work. Do you remember when Jesus went into that town, and because of their lack of, of belief, he couldn't do anything for them? Because of lack of faith, he couldn't do anything for them. And oftentimes, what happens when we let the world dominate us, we lose faith, and then we wonder, how come you're not working, God? Why are you not answering prayers, God? Why are you not taking this from me, God? I'm not learning anything from this, God. I'm really getting tired of this, God. That's because of lack of faith. But let me tell you something. You put your... Faith in Christ. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. Even as tiny as a mustard seed, God can work with that. So have faith in your troubles this evening. Have faith as, as we see the things happening around this world. As you watch the news and, well, there's always bad news, right? Bad news sells. And we are strangely attracted to bad news. Yeah, once in a while, it's good to hear a nice little story. You know, like that little kid, they got caught. Did you hear about that little kid that got caught? Doing a good thing? What did he do? Uh, he, he, was, he saw the flag and he went up to it and he pledged allegiance to the flag. Of the United, and it was cute. He got to be on Fox News with his dad and so forth. And amen. All right, let's go back to the bad stuff. <laughs> but the world is passing away in the lust of it. Amen and amen. For any of us here that are just tired of battling, I get it. Right? The frustration. I'm going to call it a godly frustration. Hey, listen, soon and very soon, this world will pass away and everything that's evil about it will pass away. But know this, meantime, meanwhile, he who does the will of God abides forever. Now let's look at Lot as a perfect example of one who walked away from godly influence, Abraham. I would like to put it like this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put Abraham as a type of the church. I'm going to put Abraham as the type of Jesus. But at the very least, he was godly influence for Lot. And Lot, well, he walked away from godly influence because he saw a business opportunity to make money, to keep his money, to have power, to attain power, Maybe to become greater than Abraham because he saw how much Abraham was being blessed. And he's just like, man, I want to be like that. Not realizing that Abraham was submitted to the Lord, given a tenth of what he owned to the Lord. Everything was on to the Lord for Abraham. But he walked away from godly influence when he chose to pitch his tent towards the wicked city of Sodom. Which you got to understand, that region, Sodom and Gomorrah, was prosperous at that time. It was the city to be in if you wanted to make money. It was happening. It was super liberal, way advanced, quote, unquote. And it was beautiful. I guess you could say like a vacation destination. And I can only imagine if the hills were super green in that region. But I tell you, that must have been a beautiful 
beautiful place before the judgment of God. But see, he saw, and that's what it says, he saw the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, and he went. And I'm sure Abraham's just like, you sure you want to go over there? Hey, I got to do what I got to do to make ends meet. And so he went. And he had everything that a man strives for, but he lost it in one day when God's judgment fell upon Sodom and Gomorrah. He had it all, and he lost it all in one day. I mean, he didn't want to leave. The angels had to rush him out. Why? I believe because he was attached to the things that he had worked so hard for. And again, that's what happens. There are some things that we work so hard for that we will not give those things up when it comes to service or ministry or even walking with the Lord. And in the process, you know the story of Lot? He lost his wife in the process. Now, she was really attached, probably living the good life. And as they were running, the angels had instructed them, don't look behind. What did she do? She looked behind, turned into a pillar of salt. Oh, and then he lost his two daughters. Well, how so? Well, you see, these girls, these daughters grew up in a very sinful city, surrounded by sinful influence. They gave up their morality, or perhaps they didn't even know what morality was because they were just surrounded by sin. And so maybe they thought, this is normal living. This is acceptable. It's just the way it is today. Maybe 20 years ago it wasn't like that, but it's acceptable now. And even now our kids are being conditioned to accept the world the way it is and are being pressured even more to accept it all completely with no reservations, no limitations. Do as you feel. How did he lose his two daughters? Well, I mean, they were hiding in a cave and they began to get worried that they would not be able to have something meaningful which for them uh, was having kids, being married, having a husband to protect them. Because as far as they knew, anyone and everyone that they knew had been killed. Sodom and Gomorrah. And so what did they do? They got their father drunk one night and they committed incest with their drunk father. And they had two children. They got impregnated by their father. See where their morality was? Or should I say the lack of? And they gave birth to Moab. and I'm just going to say Ammon. And they became the Moabites and the Ammonites. Fierce enemies, children of Israel. Look at how this family, who at one time walked with Abraham, whom the promise was made to, I will bless you and protect you. Remember what God had told Abraham? I am your great reward, your, your, your shield. Goodness, if I was lot, I'd be like, Abraham, how can I stay with you? Or at least tell me what, what I can do to have the same type of relationship that you have with Heavenly Father. And maybe Abraham did. And Lot was just like, yeah, no, that's going to cut into my time and my plans and my investment. He did what he did, and he lost his family, he lost his wife, and he lost his daughters. Even the pharaohs, the ancient pharaohs, were buried in the pyramids with all sorts of riches, which were thought to be of some use of them in the world to come. But in the end, they were only of use to the grave robbers. The pharaohs could take none of their worldly things with them to the world beyond No one drives through the gates of heaven with a moving van filled with the stuff of this world. It is true, the world is passing away. And we know that, amen? What we have to be very, very careful with is how much value we put upon the things that we've worked so, so hard to attain and to get. That's what we have to be careful with. You know, God allows us to enjoy things, amen? but it's when we make them into idols. It's it's when we turn to those things rather than God. That's when it becomes a problem. And so John says, he who does the will of God abides forever. And this stands in strong contrast to the passing world because some things are forever. It is much wiser to invest our lives into that which cannot be lost, doing 
the will of God. What are the things that last forever? Heaven and hell. Those things last forever. And it's best to invest in the things that pertain to the kingdom of God which lasts forever and ever. Invest. And some of those things are the hardest things. It's harder to disciple your children in the ways of the Lord. That's hard, isn't it? Or we just let them do whatever and hopefully they figure it out. Boy, I tell you. Or we'll let the church do it. Every Wednesday and every Sunday. Ooh, careful with that, parents. Listen, what we do here at this church is, is come alongside of you. We're the minimal parts to assist you as you disciple your own children. That's what we're here to do, to assist you, give you a, a break. Uh, but it's your job and it's your calling. And we need to take that to heart. That is the will of God, raising up your children in the ways of the Lord. That's a commandment, something that the Lord tells us to do. We need to invest. We are in regular contact with three eternal things, the Holy Spirit of God, the people around you, and the Word of God. Time, attention, and expense put into those things pays eternal rewards. So it's not that we can't have things and enjoy things, but just put them in their proper place. Put them in their proper place. May the Holy Spirit be first. May the Word of God be right there with the Holy Spirit. And may you be one that pays attention and is willing to serve and to love those around you. For these are the things that are eternal and mean something, things that pay eternal rewards. Be like Jesus. When he said in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 7, Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the volume of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. Our icon, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, our example. He comes before the Father, and his purpose here on earth was more than just die for us. It was to do the will of the Father. And he talked about that over and over and over. The things that I speak, I speak because my Father has told me to speak these things. The things that I do, I do because the Father has willed it for me to do these things. Jesus was 100% committed to the will of the Father. The question for us tonight is, are we committed to the will of the Father? Are you committed to the will of the Father? Or are you committed to other things that get in the way of you fulfilling the will of the Father? Do the will of the Father. As Peter puts it, therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. You know, when we gave our lives to Jesus, when we came to the cross, we gave up the lust of men for the will of God. That was the trade. Here's my lust, my pride of life, lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh for a new creation, no longer dominated by those things. But I like that he says, for he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. And for those of us, for those of us that are truly pursuing holiness, you know that there is suffering involved when we have to deny our flesh. Those times when we don't give up and we don't give in and so we fight and we fight and we pray and we pray and we worship and we worship. <laughs> And we call people, pray for me, I'm struggling right now. I'm being so tempted, it's crazy. I feel like I'm about to give in. Pray for me because I'm fighting hard right now. Man, there is suffering, isn't there? There's suffering. And what God is saying is it's worth it. It's worth it to suffer, to do the will of God. It's worth it to suffer, to put our flesh in check and to cease from sin. It's like detoxing. I don't know if you've ever seen anyone detox from drugs or alcohol or even cigarettes, but it's no joke, and there is suffering involved. And having been a part of that myself and, and assisted people as they go through kicking heroin, alcohol, 
we, we constantly have to tell them it's not going to last forever. This will pass, man. You just got to keep at it day at a time. Boy, and I tell you, the temptation to give in and to give up is so in their face. But then it passes. The shakes, the withdrawals, the sickness passes. And boy, I tell you, to see someone kick drugs, tobacco, alcohol, you see them on the other side, it's like, man, whoo. Man, I'm glad I'm right here right now. Boy, that was a tough time for them. It was a tough time. And life can seem like that, right? Do not give up. Do not give in. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. Maybe that's how you feel, man. You feel like you're just detoxing. I'm trying to do this Jesus thing. I'm trying to do this regular church thing. I'm trying to serve people. I'm trying to forgive my enemies. I'm trying to love people. I'm trying to really do this Jesus thing. But man, I'm struggling. I'm going through withdrawals. I miss certain things of my life. Certain things that I know are bad for me and wrong for me to do, but man, I've just gotten so used to it. I'm very uncomfortable without it. We get to that point where we're just we're like going through withdrawals. And so the author of the book of Hebrews says, Do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise for yet a little while. And he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Our deliverance is coming. And maybe for some of you, as you go through what you're going through right now, your deliverance is coming. Have confidence in the Lord. Increase your faith in Jesus. And if you're having a hard time with that, then pray that honest but true prayer. God, help me with my unbelief. Man, I'm struggling with just that. And he will. Do you believe that he will? Do you believe that God loves you? Do you believe that he exists? Do you believe that those who are in Christ Jesus, I mean, his heart is for them. He's for us. If he is for us, he could be against us. And to just have that kind of confidence, to run with such confidence, well, what can the enemy do to me? What can this world do to me with that kind of confidence? But yeah, just for a little while, we will struggle. We will go through tough times. But he is coming, and he who is coming will come, and he will not tarry. Now, may the God of peace, who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I love that. Because at first we can read this and go, oh yeah, I know, I'm supposed to do the will of God. Okay, I'm trying to do the will of God. But, but here, the, the author of Hebrews tells us that we have assistance in that. We're not alone in this. It says, he will make you complete in every good work to do his will. Did you know that God wants to assist you to do his will? And so again, we can go, Lord, I want to do your will. I'm struggling to do your will. But you said that you will enable me to do your will. Enable me to do your will, God, please. And he will make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you. And oftentimes we get caught up with me. I'm working on me right now. Wrong. Let him work in you. Us working in us is temperamental. It depends on how much it hurts, and then I'll stop. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> me working on me, if it's painful, I'm done. If it's too hard, nah. If it requires sacrifice, no. It's a very double standard. I'll put that pressure on you, but I won't put that pressure on me. And I'll even lie about it and say, I put that pressure on me, but really I, I, I haven't or I don't, and that's hypocrisy, right? That's truly what hypocrisy is, by the way. When you put pressure on other people to do things that you yourself are not doing, and when you put laws and commandments and you better be doing this, you should be doing this, but you yourself are not doing it. And Jesus talked about that. But no, it's him working in us. Let God work in you. So stay with God. Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Again, another pressure taken away from you. It's not on us. It was never meant to be on us to start and finish. No, 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 no. That pressure is upon the Lord. 
that's something that he can carry. He's the one that has started this good work, and he's the one that's going to complete it. He's going to finish the work. All we have to do is stay with him. Stay with him. Keep reading the word. Keep praying. Keep worshiping. Keep calling the people that support you spiritually or discipling you. Your spiritual parents, your brothers, your sisters in Christ. Keep doing these things. Keep coming to church. You got every Sunday, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and in between. Come on over and get you, get you some Jesus. Let him do that work in you, for he has started it and he will complete it. Therefore, my beloved, as you, has, as you have always obeyed, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Here you see the combination, our responsibility and his promise. Our responsibility is that we need to put in work. We need to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling, knowing this, that it is God who works in us to do and to will for his good pleasure. So what we need to do, we need to show up. That's our responsibility. What we need to do is we need to open the Bible. That's our responsibility. What we need to do is make time to fellowship with God. That's our responsibility. That's what we need to do. That when the opportunity comes, it is our responsibility to say yes to God, no to sin. And as we do those things, as we choose to come to, let's say, church and fellowship, God will meet us and he will work in us. He will work in you. As you open up the Bible with the purpose of fellowship and with Heavenly Father, He will do the work in you and he will speak to you and minister to you and prep you for the day or the trial to come. As you say yes to him, no to sin, he will be there to make that work ultimate. He will finish that which he started. But here we see our responsibility and his promise. If you do this, I will be there. I will assist you to the very end. If you allow this to happen, you allow me to work in you, I will complete that work. We have an incredible power. And that power is to say no to God. That's an incredible power to say no. We can actually say no, God, no, done. But we also have the opportunity and the privilege to say yes, Lord more of you in me. Do your work, finish your work in me. So may you open yourself up. May you allow God to work in you. May you say yes and amen to the Holy Spirit as it's his ministry and his desire to finish that which he started and that is to make us in the likeness of Jesus Christ, to sanctify us that we may know his will and do his will. Amen? Amen. That's as far as we're getting tonight. So let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we come before you. And we thank you, Lord God, that when you start, you finish. When you begin, you complete. And there is nothing that can stop you except our choice. And for some of you tonight, you need to choose him. You need to choose yes and amen to him. You need to open yourself up to him and trust him. I know that maybe you have trust issues because people have burned you and hurt you, and I get it. But it wasn't God who hurt you and burned you. It was God who saved you. It was God who sent his son, gave his son to redeem you. That's what God did. When it comes to God, it should be praise and worship. It should be amen and thank you. When we put everything in perspective, then we realize the truth. For too long, you've been blaming God. When it was God who was there with you as you were crying, as you were tore up over the situation, and is still with you. 
This is a word for someone or maybe several people here. But because of your lack of trust in man, you have a lack of trust in God. Say yes to God. Trust him. He has made so many promises, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will not forget you, that which I started, I will complete. I will save you, I will rescue you. You will be with me. You will overcome, you have overcome. You are more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. How many more promises do you need? And on and on and on and on it goes. Well, truly the children of God are very well protected. Well, well provided for. And so we pray, Lord God, this word will go forth into hearts and that with faith and obedience, they will turn to you, trust you, and say yes and amen to you. And for the rest of us, Lord God, that we would be an encouragement, that we would continue, Lord, making time for you, allowing you to be priority in our lives. The word, priority. Holy Spirit, priority people around us, that we would love them as you have loved us, priority. To walk in the light, priority. Empower us, Holy Spirit, to do this. For it is you working in us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's stand for this last song, please.